Ok, uh, good morning, bom dia, welcome to our virtual roundtable on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Brazil's education. I'm Thais Pires and my colleague Emily Kempf and I are the assistant directors of the Sao Paulo Global Center that is part of Notre Dame International at the University of Notre Dame, uh, located in Indiana, in the United States. Um, our center, uh, I would like to thank, to thank our colleagues, uh, our panelists, first our panelists, Tabata Amaral, Olavo Nogueira Filho, and Guilherme Lichan, and our moderator, Anne Mish, and for having accepted to be part of this panel. And I know that you, you have a busy agenda. And so thank you so much for being here and talk about this important theme for Brazil. I'd like to thank our colleagues uh, at Notre Dame International, Rafael, Mark, um, Colleen, Matt, Ellie, and Diane, uh, for helping us to organize this event. And a special thank you for Father Dow, the Assistant Provost of Internationalization that is responsible for uh, our center in Brazil. So I will pass the, the word to Father Bob to introduce the other panelists and the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Thais. Uh, bon dia, everyone. Uh, it's good to be together. And uh, I'm really pleased to, to welcome everyone to this conversation today about a matter of vital importance. And that is uh, the impact of this pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, on primary and secondary education, especially in Brazil. Um, it's perhaps one of the most important, I think, uh, challenges that we face is uh, how do we how do we further the education of our young people at this time? So I'm really, really pleased that we're able to have this conversation today. And uh, the conversation will be moderated by my great friend and colleague, Anne Misch, who's Associate Professor of Sociology and Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. So at this point, I'm just gonna turn it over to Anne and just say that the University of Notre Dame is so um, honored and, and uh, proud to, uh, host this conversation. So thanks to all the panelists and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Anne. Thank you, Thank you Father Bob. So I have from Paulo Global Center. Uh, thanks to Father Bob and NBI for the support and also to Thais Pérez um, in the Sao Paulo office for all the hard work in organizing this panel. Um, as Father Bob has said, I'm, I'm, my name is Anne Mishy. I'm a associate professor of sociology and peace studies here at Notre Dame. I'm a uh, uh, faculty member at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies and a faculty fellow at the Kellogg Institute for International Studies, both of which are here at Kiyo School of Global Affairs. So I have to admit that I convene this panel with a certain degree of saudades. I lived in Sao Paulo for about five years total between 1987 and 1997. Uh, prior to and during my PhD studies. So during the late 1980s, I lived in the Zona Leste, the Eastern Zone, the periphery of Sao Paulo. And I worked very closely with young people and other community activists who were involved in the popular movements for education during the redemocratization period. In the mid 90s, I came back to Brazil to do my dissertation research on student politics following the 1992 impeachment of the students. The first impeachment demonstrations. Educational reform was certainly a heavily debated topic during the period that I lived in Sao Paulo, and I know that these debates are continuing today, and our panelists here are thick of these discussions. So today we'll be addressing the topic, the impact of COVID-19, of the COVID-19 pandemic on Brazil's education. So I know that in the, here in the U.S., as in Brazil, we have been wrestling with the impact of COVID on our own education system. School systems are grappling with the difficult decision about whether to return to in-person classes, safety of teachers, 
staff, students, and the community with the urgent need of children to be in school, to learn, socialize, to tend to their mental health, and to free up parents for their own work. We're also wrestling here with issues of intensifying inequality, as some families and communities are better able to support the learning of their children under pandemic conditions, while others educationally and socially, even as their families experience. Here in my own city of South Bend, public school boards are voting this very week about whether to return to in-person classes with intense disagreements in our community about the best thing to do. So in many ways, there are no good answers to these questions. And decisions like this are being made daily, affecting the education and the futures of children around the world. In, in the US, as in Brazil, these discussions about education are taking place in the context of, of challenges to democratic governance, debates about the funding of public education, and extremely these questions in the Brazilian context. So let me introduce them. First, we have Tabata Amaral, who is a federal representative in the Brazilian Congress. She was elected in 2018 as the sixth most, most voted candidate in the state of Sao Paulo at the age of 24. Uh, she raised the uh, Tabata won several science Olympics and won a scholarship to attend a private uh, school, was accepted into Harvard with a full scholarship and graduated in political science and astrophysics. Since then, Tabata has dedicated herself to education policy. She co-founded the Education Map and the Acredito Movement, which brings, uh, seeks to bring new and diverse voices into electoral politics. And as a member of parliament, her main agendas are education, women's rights, Second, we have Guillermo Lichand, who is the UNICEF Assistant Professor of Child Wellbeing and Development at the University of, of Zurich. Guillermo holds a PhD in political economy and government from Harvard University. His research is focused on the impact of poverty on decision-making, as well as on how anti-corruption reform affects public service delivery. He was listed as one of the top Top 10 Brazilian innovators under 35 and named Social Innovator of 2014, according to the MIT Technology Review. He's also a social innovation specialist at the World Economic Forum Expert Network. And finally, we have Olavo Nogueira Filho, who is an alumni of the University of Notre Dame, graduated in 2010 with a bachelor's degree in business administration. He completed his post grad studies in public management, uh, public leadership in Brazil, and he is currently pursuing a master's degree in public administration at the Fundação Getúlio Vargas. From 2010 to 2012, Olavo worked at Cell Partners in Education, which is an educational agency in the quality of public schools in the state of São Paulo. In 2013, he joined the São Paulo State Department of Education, where he coordinated the design and incorporating new technologies into the classroom. Since 2016, he's been the Director of Educational Policy at Solos de la Educación. This is one of Brazil's prominent advocacy organizations in the area of education. Uh, he, he just, I think this month, became Executive Director of that organization. <clears throat> So to start us off, I would like to first invite each of you to say a, just a, a few general words about your education in Brazil. So I'm just invite, I'd like to invite you just to give us a sense of the scope of your involvement and also share with us what you think are some of the most pressing issues facing K through 12 education in Brazil, even before the pandemic. And then we'll, then we'll move on to discussing the impact of the pandemic. So why don't we start with Tabitha? Yes, so hello everyone. Good morning, bom dia. Thank you very much for inviting me to this conversation. It's a real honor to meet each and every one of you. Thais has been a great friend and is one of the people responsible for me to be able to get a scholarship at Harvard, even though I barely spoke English. So thank you very much, Thais. 
Olavo, Guilherme are also good friends who I have been following the work and who I admire very much. And it's also a great honor to get to meet you and have you as our moderator, Professor Mish. So thank you very much, everyone. And to give a, a brief answer, I'm an education activist. I've been working with education for a few years. I'm in, my, in the second year of my first mandate in Brazilian Congress. And if I had to make a very brief summary of the challenges we have uh, in front of us in Brazilian basic education, I think it's important to say that we have done a good job in the last decades, in the last years, in terms of access. So especially when we talk about the first years of basic education, we have almost uh, schools, we have schools everywhere. We have the possibility of children actually attend those schools. We still have a challenge though that I will come back to uh, in my second um, contribution in terms of high school. We have uh, high school dropout rates that amount to almost 20%. So that's a big challenge for us. But um, beyond access, we have a huge challenge in terms of quality. And that's uh, the second biggest thing that Brazilian education needs to face. So for you to have uh, an idea, uh, our students get to the third grade when they were supposed to already know how to read and write uh, properly. And more than half of them don't know how to read and write. And the majority, more than half of our students, when they do leave high school, when they have overcome the challenge of uh, all the do dropout, um, this dropout rate that I had spoken to you about before, most of them won't know what they should know in Portuguese or math. So I will also come uh, back later to this challenge. So besides uh, dropout rates in high school especially, and these, um, and I'm sorry about my English, it has been a long time since uh, I last spoke English. So besides this challenge in quality, we also have a new challenge that's common to the whole world that comes with this whole technological revolution we are going through. So we will be, um, we'll have to find a way of not only solve uh, these problems that I say are problems of the past, that Brazil um, could have solved 30 years ago, but we also have to learn how to build schools that actually teach us to be creative, to be uh, cooperative, to be resilient, and to show all those characteristics that robots still don't have, and that will be, that will be more and more important in this economy of the future that is literally happening now. So that, those will be my first contributions and I'm looking forward to the debate. Wonderful, thank you, Tabata. Uh, Guillerme, can you share with us some of your thoughts? Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Michi, for the introduction. Uh, very pleased to be here with Tabata and Olavo and all the colleagues. Um, technology sometimes not helping me, but uh, <laughs> I'm here. So I think Tabata put it really well. Uh, the quality challenge, challenge was here even before the pandemic, and it's probably going to stay with us for a really long time. It's a global education crisis, as the World Bank put it in the last World Development Report, uh, that uh, has an, I mean, we made a lot of progress in, in terms of enrollment. So children are in school, as Tabata put but you know they're not learning very much and then the challenge with the pandemic we'll, we'll talk much more about it is that you know those structural challenges are going to stay and and you know maybe they're going to become more acute because now we have an economic crisis that are, that's going to be very long lasting right we have the, the brazilian gdp is expected to fall by maybe 10 percent this year the highest uh, drop in economic activity since we started measuring gdp and that's going to mean families losing employment, especially the poorest ones, and building up debt. And, and that takes very long, I, typically, to unravel. And, you know, with the, that creates lots of pressures for, for children, especially teenagers, to drop out of school, try to support the family economically. Um, labor market returns to education tend to go down. So education will suffer for quite so many years, even like with kind of very 
fundamental structural challenges that have nothing to do with the circumstantial challenges that the pandemic is, brings about that are specific to the sanitary crisis that we're uh, going through. So what's going to make it even more challenging is that on top of those structural pressures, we have the circumstantial pressures. We cannot, we have school shut down. We cannot have, uh, you know, regular classes take place. Uh, we don't have the proper technology in, in place for hybrid learning to, or, or distance learning to actually take place as it should. So even before the pandemic, you know, if you look at the national survey of uh, technologies in schools, we only had, I believe, something like 5% of schools with connectivity of 50 megabits per second or higher. Uh, a school in the US is not even considered connected if it has less than 100 Mbps in terms of a, a connection speed. So I think by that criteria, maybe none of our schools would have made that cut uh, before the pandemic. And, you know, combined with that, we have teachers that are not trained to use technology, according to the same survey, across all states. It never, it always the case that at least two thirds of teachers would say they never received any training to use online solutions. So that's how we arrived at the pandemic. Uh, and combined with a setting where if it's true that it's more and more common that uh, students' households would have uh, cell phones, those cell phones are not our typical uh, iPhone uh, X, you know, super connected and with a great interface for us to uh, access these educational uh, tools. So the infrastructure, so these students would often suffer already again before the pandemic with um, with inequality in access so those of course from the private schools and so on able to access wonderful adaptive learning platforms and to learn at their own pace and close the you know their, their gaps uh, as they want whereas in public schools often students without the adequate uh, technology or connectivity to actually do so and again during the pandemic those inequalities were magnified and you know we don't have a a very clear, in my mind, we, we don't have a very clear solution to deal with the circumstantial impact while we still try to address those structural issues that are going to be with us for, for a long time. So I think the challenge is huge and I'm happy to discuss it more throughout our conversation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Guillerme. Olavo, can you start us off with some opening thoughts? Sure, good morning, uh, Professor N. Good morning, Father Bob. Good morning, Thais and Emily representing the, in the Sao Paulo Global Center. First of all, let me, let me thank, uh, thank you for, for the invitation to, to be here. Let me say a special hello to folks from the ND Alumni Club who I see are here at, uh, at this chat. I see, I see Chris Lund, I see Josh and Emily Kempf, I see, I see Marcio, I see Luis, uh, I see Laura as well, who's not an alum yet, and she's a, well, she's a student. She worked with, uh, with us for, a couple of years ago, Laura, nice to see you as well. Uh, and uh, let me just say on a personal note before I, I provide a, a few remarks on, uh, on the question that uh, Professor Ann posed, uh, how, how special it is for me uh, as, a, as, as an alum to, to, to be a part of this, uh, this discussion. Uh, as Ann mentioned in the introduction, I, gra I graduated uh, 10 years ago and uh, you know, the, 10 year celebrations are usually important uh, on all fronts. And for me this year marks an important uh, form, uh, point in my, in my life, uh, you know, graduating from the University of Notre Dame, especially because uh, of the, the role that the university played uh, in how my career has uh, been shaped over, over the last 10 years. Uh, I say this uh, often in, uh, and it's not because I'm, I'm here at an ND event, but uh, if, if it wasn't for ND, I probably, uh, or not probably, I, I'm pretty sure I would, not, uh, I would not be doing what I'm doing today. Uh, I would not be working with what I'm working today. Uh, you know, I, I had an interest in, uh, in development work, in, in education before I went to Notre Dame, but it was at Notre Dame that this, this interest uh, really became a passion uh, and then later on became, uh, you know, has become my, my career. And, and he was instrumental in uh, not only uh, preparing me for this, uh, but in providing me the incentive and the support to take on uh, this, uh, this challenge. A, a non-traditional route for somebody graduating from business school, uh, as, uh, as this was my major at, at Notre Dame. But as we learn at Notre Dame, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's something pretty exciting 
about uh, working uh, to improve, uh, you know, the, the challenges that, uh, that we face as, you know, communities, as countries, and to improve the lives of others is oftentimes much more exciting than, than trying to improve our own lives. So I just wanted to say this, uh, you know, brief remark here as, and how happy I am to, 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 to be here. On the, on the question, uh, I, I think Tabata and Guilherme provided a, a, a pretty good context about, uh, you know, the, not only the, the state of education uh, you know, before COVID uh, arrived, uh, but also uh, Guilherme touched on a, on, on a general picture of the, of the impacts that, that we have. And uh, when we look at, uh, and we did this at, uh, at Todos pela Educação, the organization that, that I work, we looked, uh, this was still in the first semester of this year, COVID had been around for two, three months, and we decided to take a look at, uh, at the experience of other countries and other regions uh, in the world that in the recent past, so not in the COVID scenario, but uh, in other scenarios, be it because of natural disasters, be it because of uh, post-war uh, context or even local pandemics, uh, places that, had, uh, that, that faced a, a long uh, shutdown uh, of schools and and what we tried to, to, to understand was what, what can be learned from these experiences in terms of, uh, of the impacts? What, uh, what happens uh, during the time when kids are uh, for such a long time away from school? And what happens when they come back? And there are two main messages, uh, just to, to complement on what uh, Tabata and, and Guilherme said so that we can get going on the, on the discussion. The first one is that the impacts are of multiple dimensions. Uh, this, uh, we oftentimes talk about, oh, uh, kids are not in school, so there's going to be a problem of learning, and uh, they're going to fall behind their studies. And of course, that's uh, that's an important part as well. But what the experience of other countries show uh, is that uh, oftentimes during crises like these, when you go four, five, six, and in Brazil we're going to our seventh month month of you know schools being shut down, uh, the impacts are uh, are much more broad. We're talking about social impacts in, in the kids' lives, uh, nutritionally. Uh, this is a, there's a big hit. Emotionally, uh, there's a big impact. So uh, this paints a picture of the of the challenge we're going to have once it's safe to to return. And the second message, and here uh, I'll finish this first uh, in, uh, introduction, is that these effects are long lasting. Uh, it's not something that will uh, uh, you know sustain for a couple of months when we get back, and then uh, you know a few actions here and there will be able to. Uh, to, to, to make it all uh, back to normal. Uh, what the experience shows is that these, these effects will be long lasting and thus this uh, right away uh, suggests that we are gonna need a long-term plan uh, in terms of uh, you know, providing uh, an adequate answer uh, to, to the challenge that, uh, that, is, uh, that is consolidating. So, so I think that's, uh, that, that's the, uh, the real, the, the real uh, challenge that we have, uh, it's uh, as Tabata and Guilherme said, uh, before the pandemic hit, Brazil had many challenges in education. And now with the pandemic, these challenges that already exist are going to uh, become even larger and new challenges are going to arise. So there's going to be a lot of, a lot of work that uh, uh, you know, Brazil is going to have to do if we are to, to face this adequately and, and respond adequately. Thank you, Olavo. So, I think the, the panelists have already started to launch into the, our, our first question about the pandemic. Um, let me just invite people. We have about, about um, it seems like 36 people uh, um, on the call. So I want to invite people, if you have questions, put them in the chat. Rafael Guerra will be collecting questions um, and um, will help, help to insert them into the conversation as they come up. So feel free to, to ask your questions in the chat. And uh, so our starting substantive question about the current crisis is really, in general, like how are you assessing the impact of the pandemic on Brazil's education so far? And so we've already kind of launched into that, but let me, let's, I'll give it back to Tabitha now to, um, to dive into that question. Yes, um, Brazil is one of the most unequal democracies in the whole world. And when we are talking about a sanitary crisis of this proportion and the socioeconomic crisis that come with it, uh, what it uh, does in the country is that all our inequalities 
that were already very big, they become even bigger and they are exposed. And it's no different when we talk about education. So right now we are talking about literally millions of students who are sharing one or two rooms, uh, small houses with all their family members who have no access to internet, who have no adequate equipment, and some who have had no contact with their schools for those last six, seven months. And to, to help us um, develop this conversation, I'd like to share uh, a few data. So many researchers have been conducted um, by UNESCO, um, by Datafolia, and many other institutes. And what they show us is really scary. So first, uh, at, out of five students, at least one has not received anything from their schools. So they are completely disconnected from their schools. Uh, another study has shown, this one is more recent, that 53% of the students uh, feel like they are not learning anymore, that they have lost the ability to learn during the pandemic. So we are talking about more than uh, half of their students. Uh, two other studies have shown that one third of high school students consider not going back to school because they were so demotivated by uh, the pandemic. And another study that um, shows us similar that's very close to this has shown us that 38% of parents or like uh, adults who are responsible for those students when they have uh, children who are in high school, they are 38% of them uh, are scared and think that their children might not go back to school. So what we are seeing now is uh, a real disconnection like we are cutting all the connection that existed before between students and parents. So I agree with what Olavo said. We are not only talking about the learning that's not happening. We are talking about all the anxiety, all the stress, all the uh, mental illness that come from this disconnection. We are talking about a huge increase in dropout rates. And that's what scares me the most. And we are talking about and one thing that's important to say, many studies have been already be co have been conducted in Brazil by Ricardo Paes de Barros, who is a great Brazilian economist. And they have shown that uh, what Brazil loses every single year because of those almost 20%, 17% uh, of the students who don't conclude high school, who don't finish high school, amounts to 240 billion reais. So I think it's important to say that our constitution says that basic education is a right, which is not guaranteed to everyone every single year here in Brazil. And I'm just scared of the economic, um, the health, the security, all the consequences to this increase in dropout rate. This 240 billion has Brazil loses every single year, uh, every single year happens because when someone doesn't finish high school, what it means is that this person is going to live for fewer years, he or she has a greater chance of involving with criminality, he or she will have more uh, health problems, will receive small, smaller salaries throughout uh, his or her entire life. So I, I'm truly scared of uh, what is happening in Brazil right now. And I, I, I'm sure it's no news to you, but we are also going through, uh, we are living a very polarized moment in our society. So it's almost impossible to have any type of conversation, of conversation. And education has been also a victim to this polarization. So on one side, we have people who still don't believe in the pandemic. I have no idea how that is possible. But those people say that, well, this is all a lie, so we should open schools right now. On the other side, we have people who say, uh, who call anyone who is trying to have this conversation a genocide which is really irresponsible. Uh, and these people are saying that we should only talk about going back to schools once we have a vaccine. And this makes me so sad because for me, this is the uh, greatest proof I have had in the last few years of how much people don't care about education. You see people going to the streets for, for us to open bars, uh, for us to open gyms, um, to open all sorts of places shows, concerts, and so on. But no one seems to care that our students have been out of school for over six months, that they are not receiving any activity from their schools. No one seems to care about this uh, certain increase in the dropout rates. 
So what we need now, and it's extremely hard because we are with our fourth minister of education and he literally said yesterday that this was not with him. He said that connecting students uh, was not his, uh, his duty. He said that coordinating this process of going back to schools was not his duty. So it's a really hard time in Brazil. But what we need to do is to learn uh, with other countries' experience. We need to understand how we can do that in a safe way. So how many students can we have um, at the school at the same time? We need to have some of them at home, some of them in school. Not all teachers, not all students will be able to go back if um, because of their age, because of their health conditions. So we need uh, a lot of protocols in terms of distancing, um, in terms of uh, sanitizing measures, but we also need to connect those schools. We need to connect those students. And here I agree 100% with what Lishan says said, if uh, in Brazil, this is not a new problem, our students are not connected, our schools are not connected, but I literally cannot see a way of us moving um, toward a, a new, a hybrid, a new education system, or trying to present a solution to that if we don't solve the, so, uh, the connection problem. There is at this moment a, a very good project in the Senate that uh, could be approved. It's the PIECI for those who are from Brazil that uh, has a good plan for connecting our Brazilian schools. I'm one of the authors of another important project that is uh, on the Chamber of Deputies that talks about connecting students and teachers. And it, uh, our intention now is to use what we call the war budget that uh, Congress approved in order to connect those students and teachers. And uh, my biggest uh, anxiety, anxiety and what makes me the saddest right now is that it has been so hard to have this conversation, to even talk about a plan, to even talk about those projects, to even tell people that, well, I'm very sorry, but if you wait until everyone has received the vaccine, you lose a whole part of an entire generation and there's nothing you'll be able to do in the future. So uh, I, I'm sorry if I, uh, if I sound, uh, I don't know, very saddened by what's happening. I'm a very optimistic person. I've been fighting uh, every single day in Congress, in all the conversations I have. But uh, for me, it's really hard to separate this conversation for this polarized moment that Brazil is going through, in which no one wants to talk about data, no one wants to talk about the evidence, people's reality or any planning, it seems to be more important to be popular uh, within your social network bubble. But I, I still hope that we can, we can break that somehow and that we can build a solution together. Tabata has put a lot of, re of, the, of the really serious issues and problems of the, of the pandemic situation on the table. Uh, Guillerme, what would you like to add to this question of how the pandemic has affected Brazilian education? Right. So, I mean, adding to what Tabata mentioned, I'd like to just cover the uh, different actors uh, in terms of how they've been impacted. So I want to speak briefly on students and families and then teachers and school staff and then education secretariats, because it's important to kind of uh, give an overview. But, uh, but for each of them, I'd like to highlight also, we have to talk about the impact that we have, we, we kind of know by now but also about the impacts that we still don't know. It's very important now that we acknowledge that we still don't know very key <laughs> dimensions of those impacts because we, we have to generate evidence uh, if we are to you know, make the necessary strides in, in mitigating those impacts. So in terms of the students and families, what we already know at the moment is that first expected dropouts are expected to spike this year and probably for the following years as well. So I Tabata touched on that. So we have national service, uh, surveys showing that for teenagers, so the last years like middle school and high school, dropouts this year might reach uh, you know, 30 or 40%. So twofold what's already typical uh, in a normal year. So our dropout rates are high. She pointed that out. They're going to be higher <laughs> this year in the coming years, maybe twice as high. And in some states, these numbers are scary in terms of how fast they're rising uh, and, and also you know, how high they're actually getting. 
in Sao Paulo, we, you know, I can say more in, in my next intervention in, in terms of what we can do. But uh, as part of our work in the state, we're monitoring week by week families' attitudes or motivation to send kids back to school. And what they're saying is that before a vaccine uh, comes out, 70% of parents are against uh, sending kids back to school. 70%. So Tabata said that, you know, an earlier survey was saying 38%, that number is now twice as high. We see this also in Goyas where we're following students from high school students from, you know, full-time schools. These are, you know, the students that may be more engaged, closer to, to, to the schools in normal times. We, we were following them since June. And then the motivation to go back to school or, or the flip side of it, the, the expected dropout rate it started at something like 15% and, and in, in a month, at the end of July, it was already at 40%. So the, the challenge there is huge and that we already know. So expected dropouts are gonna be a huge problem unless we do something about it and we can say more about what we can do. But of course, it depends on understanding what exactly are the sources uh, of that uh, motivation not to come back to school. So part of it we can address. Part of it is this disconnect. So families and students do not hear from the school often or they, you know, they're not reached by the technologies through which the, the content is being broadcasted. Uh, so part of it is developing better tools to, to make sure we reach out the students or trying to you know, reach students and families with a more emotional kind of a connection, accommodating message, trying to get parents and, and, and kids closer to, to the school life, even without regular classes. A part of it are challenges that are part of this thing that I said we still don't know. They're going to sit with us for a long time. What's the share of the kids, uh, of children in, in school age that are now working, even if part-time, you know, doing delivery or whatever to support their families? We don't know. And if we don't know, we cannot act. You know, that will require policies of their own conditional cash transfers that you know go later like up to high school to make sure these kids are in school but we don't know what the right size of those transfers to make sure kids are in school because we don't know the size of the problem so that's in terms of students and their families what we kind of know and what we, a lot that we still don't know we also don't know for sure the share of students that's accessing uh, content uh, during uh, the school shutdown. Why? Because some of the content is being disseminated through a variety of forms. Some of them we can track. So Sao Paulo, for instance, has their own app with zero rating. So, you know, they know student by student who is uh, accessing and for how long. But many students are accessing through TV or in other states like Goyaz, they're offline. They go to the school, they pick up homework on a bag, on a plastic bag, they do it and they turn it back. It's great that they can do it, but we don't know. <laughs> so if we don't know, then it's hard to really understand how to you know, expand these this offerings to make sure we're reaching everyone effectively. Uh, and something that's very big that we don't know for students is what's the learning gap. We don't know how the size of the delay, you know, what, and that's critical for first, you know, how to try to remedy that gap. But the second, uh, how to make sure it's Kind of customize each student is going to need something different so we're going to need diagnostic evaluations very high priority when schools or classes are back and so just as a baseline diagnostic to, to know how to act but also we're going to need kind of high frequency assessments even if it's just a sample for us to understand how students are evolving when schools are back when it comes to teachers then i'll be much briefer but you know it's been a huge burden on teachers they're doing the jobs that they've been doing already plus a lot more they have to be psychologists of children and, and parents. They have to deal with their own challenges of having to teach from home, often with inadequate you know, technology and, and connectivity. I think it's been very hard on teachers with very little training. They're doing much more hours and they're scared. They have, if they have to go back without the proper conditions, they're older, more susceptible to the symptoms and, and, and the risks of the disease. Uh, we know very little about teachers. We, I think we don't know for sure how many hours a typical teacher is working, uh, what support he or she needs. So I think we have to learn a lot more to design the proper incentives, especially as they go back to school. Uh, and then secretariats, Olavo for sure will say more, but we know they've been hit hard by the economic dimensions of it. They are underfunded in a time when they have to fund more 
<laughs> so I think the challenges are huge in terms of the impacts we know, but also in terms of what we don't know, we have to figure out a way to quickly generate information such that we can act upon it for these three layers. Thank you, Guillaume. I recognize a lot of those issues that, uh, that we're facing here in the US, although there are some added complexities in the Brazilian situation. Olavo, um, how has the controversy or how, how, how has the, the pandemic impacted the educational system? You, you launched into that before, but let's go a little deeper now. Sure. Uh, I'll try not to, to re repeat Tabata and Guilherme who provided, uh, again, good, good, good context and, uh, and good info here. Um, well, uh, both Tabata and, and Guilherme will use the word scary. Uh, and, and I think it is, uh, it is the right word, I think, to describe what, uh, what we've been seeing and uh, what the uh, short term uh, looks like in terms of, uh, of the challenges. Uh, I know on the second part and the third part of our discussion here, we're going to get a little bit more into the what can we do about it, or else our audience here, Tabata and Guilherme, are, gonna, uh, are just going to leave the, the session here uh, pretty, pretty emotionally uh, you know, hit. So... <laughs> But uh, as Guilherme said, we, we, we ha in order to, to respond adequately, in order to face the challenge, you, ha you, have, to, you have to put a finger on it. Uh, and, you, and you have to, to, to really know what, uh, what we're dealing with. Uh, and, uh, and this can't be, can't be neglected. I, I'd add two points uh, to what uh, they both said. First, uh, just reinforce something that I think uh, uh, was present uh, implicitly in, in, their, in their remarks, which is that... Uh, you know, the pandemic brings challenges to everyone, uh, and, and, they're, and they're great. And, and all over the world, we see that. Uh, you know, no, nobody can uh, uh, contain it 100% and say, okay, this is not going to get there. Maybe a few places, a few islands. It seems New Zealand did a fantastic job in, in getting it out right away, but it hits and it brings a, a great deal of challenges to all sectors and uh, education on the least. But the fact of the matter is that in, in Brazil, we have been amplifying uh, the, the impacts of, of COVID because of our own choices uh, and because of the, the, the way we've gone about uh, uh, some, some decisions. And so I'll, and, and there's a specific context that uh, actually uh, plays an important role as well. I'll just uh, briefly uh, say four things that uh, you know, we've done in, in terms of a country that uh, leads us to the scenario that Tabata and Guilherme uh, both described. First of all, first of all uh, in comparison to other countries, uh, and in, in, that, in that sense, in very similar fashion to what has been going on in the U.S., we have been very bad in controlling the pandemic. Uh, and, and this is, you know, obviously partly because of what Tabata said, you know, the federal government pretty much neglects uh, the, the, the importance of trying to contain it, undermines the, the, the risks and, uh, and the reality uh, of COVID. Uh, Health-wise, uh, but also we've seen in uh, you know states and municipalities, it's been pretty uh, pretty different approaches uh, all over Brazil. Some some places have been very rigorous right from the, the get-go, and they have been able to do a better job. Other places have not uh, been so uh, so so strict about uh, you know making sure you stop right away the pandemic, because the, the the longer it takes to control the pandemic, uh, the longer it will take for us to to, to return to school. Uh, and uh, something that Tabata says, uh, you know, the discussion is, is uh, you know, poses a, the wrong question. It's not about uh, opening or not opening. Uh, it's about discussing, you know, when it's safe to reopen, how do we do it? That's a discussion we should be having right now. But the, but the problem is that, uh, you know, in much, many places in, in Brazil, it's not very safe yet to, to return, unfortunately, because of our own choices. So that's the first thing. It doesn't surprise me, and I think it's comprehensible, that the population, uh, seventy percent of the parents of the population, are scared, because uh, you know we haven't dealt uh, adequately from from a health standpoint. The second thing is that uh, you know, and I mentioned this uh, in my first point, but public, public authorities in Brazil have been contradicting themselves. Uh, so you, again, federal government says one thing, uh, undermines the the problem. Then state will say something. Then the municipality will open bars. Uh, it's tough for the population to, to really understand, okay, so who should we follow here? Uh, what, what should we be believing in? And this creates a mess, creates a confusion. Uh, people are scared naturally. And when people are scared, uh, communication that's not, uh, you know, 
very well delivered uh, creates uh, more confusion. Third, our federal government in terms of education, Tabata mentioned this, uh, the Ministry of Education, and, and Tabata mentioned this, it's, it's not a, we're not guessing here, we're not, a, they actually said that yesterday. They're pretty much saying, look, this is not with us. Problems of education uh, in the states and municipalities, not our problem. No? They don't have management of the schools and then they say, okay, this is states and municipalities who have to deal with it. And, and this is uh, absurd. Uh, this is, first, this is, this is wrong from a constitutional standpoint. Uh, they don't under, they're not understanding what their role is constitutionally. And second of all, to a point that pa Tabata said, around 20% of the kids uh, in schools over the last six months haven't had any sort of contact with their school, any, any whatsoever. Uh, so they're six months uh, completely disconnected from, from the schools. And this will lead to, as Lishan said, to uh, dropout rates increasing and so forth. But when you look at who are these kids, who are the 20% that have been by and large not being reached? These are the poorer kids in the northern regions of the country, in the rural areas of the country, in the smaller municipalities. Those are the ones that need help, that need support, especially from the federal government who can provide that help as to make sure that uh, you know, the mitigation efforts were a little bit uh, better. So that's the second point, or the third point. And fourth, uh, fourth point here, in the, in, and I'll conclude, uh, we, uh, well, unfortunately, this is contextual and m not much we could do about it, but municipal elections coming up uh, in, a, in a couple of months have really, uh, uh, really made something that was already challenging much more challenging because what we've been seeing motivated by uh, electoral uh, you know, motives, many mayors, current mayors, who will go to re-election uh, are simply saying that, I don't want to deal with this problem now, send it to, to 2021. Uh, I don't want to discuss opening schools at the moment. And the problem with this is that in some places, we've, we might be able to control the pandemic in the, in the next couple of months. And, and the other problem is that when, once they do that, what they're, what they're pretty much saying is that oh, I'm not going to even prepare uh, for when it's safe to reopen. So what will happen is the management uh, and the, the, the mayors that assume and, and, and pick, up the, uh, pick up power in, in January, all of a sudden are going to say, okay, so now I have to understand where I'm at. And I have to prepare myself to a safe reopening, which takes two, three months if you're, if you're going to do it adequately. So we're talking about in some places, schools are going to reopen in March, April, and maybe they, should, they could have restarted before. Uh, so again, it's a uh, big challenges. Uh, context has not helped us much with the elections, but again, choices that we've made uh, in terms of, uh, you know, public authorities have, uh, have made this even, even more challenging. What we have to do now is, okay, th this is what we have. So what, what, what do we do now? What, how do we deal with this, uh, with this problem uh, as, we get, as we get going? But I understand we're going to get into this in the next... Uh, next phases here of our, of our discussion. Right. It is interesting to, to, I mean, to, to wrestle with how the timeline of the electoral politics is interfering in the, the timeline of how we deal with the pandemic and, and, and education. So let's turn to the, the second uh, question, which builds on what you're, you've already been touching on it a bit, which is what is your take on um, the controversy that is currently has surged in regards to the school reopening question? You touched on it a bit, but if you go a little bit deeper on that, top of that. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to comment on I, I, some things that people sent me through the chat or what I heard from Olavo and Guilherme. First, we have, uh, we have measured that in Sao Paulo and child labor has increased 21% during the pandemic. So what Guilherme said is abs like absolutely right and Yes, it is indeed scary. And some people ask me about, uh, so what is the role of the Ministry of Education, of governors and mayors? So I think it's important to comment on that. We literally have our legislation that makes it very clear that our minister or our Ministry of Education has a role of coordination and support. So what they, what they should have been doing since the very beginning of the pandemic is to coordinate the efforts. So how, how can we connect the students? How can we connect the schools? How can we um, make partnerships with TV channels, with uh, data providers? We have almost 60,000 municipalities in Brazil. 
uh, we, we cannot expect that all of them, some of them with 10,000 inhabitants or even less, that they will solve this problem by themselves. So when we have uh, the Minister of, of Education saying, oh, this is not with me, this is not about me, what we see, in fact, is that especially uh, smaller states and it's really even worse with the municipalities. Smaller, smallest and poorest municipalities, they won't have um, any chance of providing an education solution during this moment. So what we expect from uh, our federal government is to coordinate this effort. So for instance, we are speaking about a lot of protocols that need to be designed for the Brazilian context. So uh, what is the distance in between students? Uh, what are the cleaning protocols? So what are going to wear? Are we talking about face shield? Are we talking about masks? So how many students can a school support? We know that it might be something between 20 and 30% of the students at a time. So those are decisions that should not be led um, to almost 6,000 municipalities. It's really important that the Minister of Education steps in and says, okay, I'm doing the coordination, I'm giving um, the main protocols, and you adapt each of those protocols to your reality. It's not in the decision of the federal government to say whether our public schools are going to open or not, because high school um, schools are of the responsibility of states. And when we talk about uh, until the ninth grade, this is the responsibility of uh, mayors. But it's really hard, uh, and I really cannot imagine that things are going to, to work when we have 27 states designing their, their own protocols and their own data, and when we have almost 6,000 municipalities. So what to expect from the Minister of Education? This uh, coordination, this support with internet connection, and so on. And yes, it's really uh, clear to us as well that uh, the fact that we are in less than two months electing our mayors and our city councils has had an in, a huge impact in that discussion because their return is costly, uh, it's complex, it requires a lot of planning. So may, especially those mayors who are running for re-election, they have no interest in talking about it at this moment. Uh, I think it's really important uh, and answer your question, Professor M. It's really important for us to have in mind that we are not talking about going back to the school that we left in March. And I agree 100% with Olavo said, we need to discuss when. So what is the metric? How, how do we know that we are ready to do that? I'm 100% sure that we cannot wait for the vaccine because it might take um, six months, one year for us to give the access to the, vac the vaccine to everyone. But we haven't had this discussion in Brazil. We are lucky somehow because many countries have done that already. We can look at the French, the French experience. We can learn from them. But as of now, we don't have any planning about when and how to do it. What I know is that it's not the same thing we had in March. We won't, again, we won't be able to have all the students at the same time. That we have to have maybe one third, one fifth of the students at one period, one fifth at the other period, the other one fifth in the second day. And those students will need to be connected for those times in which they are not in school. We also know that we will need a lot of psychological support. A lot of students, teachers, uh, school staff have lost important family members. Brazil has lost almost 150,000 lives to COVID-19. A lot of those um, children have had to work in the last few months to support their family because their parents lost their job. So if we don't prepare to give the psychological support once our students are back to school, we are gonna fail again. Another thing that's going to be very important, we'll need to have an active search for those students who are not going back. I'm really scared about the dropout rate. So once we return, we'll have to understand why aren't you coming to school? Oh, because you have a health problem. So that's how you're going to receive all the, uh, the school material because you don't feel safe, that's okay. But if it's because you have lost your hope, you have lost um, this belief that we had that you can change your life through education, well, we'll have to have a plan to go at the student schools to talk to them. We can just, we can just like, ignore it and think it's okay that one third uh, or even more I'm just abandoning um, basic education. And one thing that I'd like to add, uh, when we talk about uh, complex problems, 
we have to have always in mind that yes, a lot of things are true. We are not saying that um, we agree that the pandemic poses a lot of risks to students, to teachers, to school staff, to those students' families. We are not ignoring it. This is a reality. And that's why we cannot go back tomorrow. We need a plan. We need all those protocols. But at the same time, it's also true, together with this first thing, that if we don't do anything, if we leave things as they are now, those students are not finishing high school. Yes, they will leave fewer years. So when we deny someone's access to basic education, it's a slow death, but nonetheless death. And that's one thing that we don't understand. We are saying that those students will leave for fewer years, they will have smaller salaries, they won't be able to break the cycle of poverty, they will have more chances of getting involved with criminality. So all of those things are true. And what we need is a complex uh, solution, a complex plan that doesn't ignore one of those two. And one, what happens in a polarized time as this one is that some people choose this um, truth to, to be held as the only truth and another part to choose this truth, but they are equally true. And we have to, to give some solution to think something about them. So I hope I have answered, but I also try to bring in my, uh, some of the things that people are sending me in the chat. Thank you, Talitha. Um, Guillerme, your take on, <clears throat> on the school reopening controversy. Wonderful. So I will discuss two takes on it. One is the kind of academic take or scientific take, should schools reopen or not? And then I will speak about the, I think, public policy take or the public manager's uh, take on it. So because they're very different, uh, you'll see. So I think from the academic take, my opinion has changed very substantially over the course of, of this debate. So I started uh, you know, from a technical standpoint thinking that this problem is extremely complex in, because in isolation it is. So it started with a situation where everyone is perfectly isolated, right? Kids are staying at home, every parent is staying at home, and then we have to decide should schools reopen and how should we do it? This I think is extremely complex. You would have to evaluate different protocols and then keep track for each protocol. Uh, what's going on in terms of the disease, activity of the disease, transmission rates, uh, inpatients, uh, the cases, inpatients, deaths, uh, and then uh, you know, analyze the trade-offs of the health impacts, potentially negative health impacts that the reopening would bring about with the educational gains uh, of this. So the mitigating learning losses, dropout and so on. So in the abstract, again, as I said, it's a very complex problem because we have no theory to base you know, the prediction. We have to see in practice and then rigorously evaluate. And these experiments are controversial. You know, this is a very complicated problem. Now, uh, in, I came to believe, and you know, what I'll say is controversial, okay? But uh, you know, for the situation in Brazil, I came to believe that from a technical standpoint, it's actually pretty straightforward what the answer to this question is. Schools should reopen, and the reason is no one is isolated. So kids are not you know, just sitting at home, and parents are not just sitting at home, partly because they cannot, right? Like the economic pressures push them to just you know, go out and, and, and work because they have to, they cannot do home office as the wealthy uh, parents can. Uh, and so the, the audience of the public schools is already not at home. They are using public transit. They are you know, working outside. These kids are helping at home or they're, you know, every, everything else open, as Tabata mentioned, you know, so people are going to the restaurants and gyms and people are working in these restaurants and gyms and, and everything else. So in, in that perspective, the schools have no special status, okay? There is no, it's not a privileged locus of like the disease has a different activity there. <laughs> the disease spreads and would spread in the school as much as it spreads everywhere else. So I think, again, from a technical scientific perspective, it's controversial because, again, I would like to measure and I'm actually engaged in this with one Brazilian state that's actually serious about rigorously evaluating it. I'm going to be part of the process. I think it's worthwhile doing it still. But I don't think we're going to learn that much given the situation, because I think it's just like the, the counterfactual is not the counterfactual where we're treating the schools separately. Now, we can discuss why in the public debate, we, we treat schools as such a, you know, with such a special status. And I think the reason is something we knew already before the pandemic, 
this generation of schools, of parents, sorry, it's a, it's a generation uh, for whom their children have, uh, are more advanced in school than they ever were. So they, they value education and, and they are extremely satisfied with education as a public service over any, any other service. So often if you interview like poor parents in Brazil, they're quite unhappy about health services, even though they can get it for free in, in SUS, but they're extremely pleased with education because their kids have access to it, they're enrolled in school and they are studying for longer than their parents ever did. I guess that's why education is held to a higher standard and we expect schools to only reopen if they have the most safe protocol, even though everywhere else has no differential protocol in place. But that means that the situation for the public manager is much harder than the controversial statement that I made that it's just a no-brainer that we should reopen. For the public manager, it's, you have to change the discourse because people, they, they expect higher standards from schools means that public managers have to show evidence that schools can provide those high standards. You know, that, that's, that's, that's what's so hard about it. And you have pressures from the teachers and the school unions that, you know, maybe for the right reason, then as any worker that would, would switch from home office to being forced to go there face to face, want to know that they actually have the proper conditions to work. So I think the real pressure and, and the real challenge comes from you know, ensuring that for the teachers, it's gonna be safe for them to be there, but also in terms of discourse, uh, you know, making parents comfortable that the, the standards there are not gonna be lower than any, anywhere else, I guess. And it's not an easy conversation to switch, uh, just given that the baseline it's as we mentioned, 70% of the parents at the moment are against uh, sending their kids back to school before a vaccine. So huge challenge for the public manager, but uh, I don't think it's uh, the nature of the challenge is it's very technical actually. Thank you, Guillerme. Um, Olavo, so to, to what extent do you agree with Guillerme and Tabata on the school reopening question? Yeah, I, th I think uh, sim sim similar approach. Uh, the way we've been, uh, we've been, uh, no, positioning uh, ourselves at Todos Pela Educação in, the, in this, as, as Tabata mentioned, in this frustrating debate where, you know, you, you have to be on, on, on one of the extremes to, you know, to, to actually you know, be heard, uh, which, which is the frustrating part. Uh, what we've been saying, as I mentioned in the, 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 late, in the, the re recent uh, segment that we had, uh, no, for, we, we got to change the, the approach in terms of, uh, of the discussion. This, this discussion of uh, open or not will, not will not lead us to anywhere. It's, it's, it's going to par you know, paralyze everyone uh, because as Tabata said, there, there are truths uh, in, in the arguments uh, that, uh, that all folks are bringing. Yeah, it's completely comprehensible for uh, you know, the teachers and the, the parents and the, and the unions to, to, to be wary of uh, the health problems. And, and again, if, if, it's a, if they're exaggerating or not, uh, it's not for us to judge, I think, uh, because this is, this is the reality. Uh, and, and again, as I mentioned, if it's exaggerated, it's because we haven't been communicating well in terms of our public authorities. We have been amplifying a problem that uh, it's already huge and we become even, uh, it's become even huger. So uh, you, have, uh, you have that part of the truth. And then you have the other part of the truth and Tabata brought this, uh, Guilherme, brought the technical, uh, you know, uh, arguments now that look, uh, you know, this, this is a brutal impact the, the, the longer we take, uh, the, the, the worse it's going to be. And as Guilherme said, uh, are we really looking at the scientific data to, 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 to advance this, uh, this, this discussion? And, and, and I think we're not, uh, in, in the general picture, we're not. So again, I think it, first thing in order for us to advance in this discussion is we've got to change the approach. It, it can't be, uh, open or not open, but you know how, how do we open? And this question, uh, it's it's not trivial because we're not only talking about how do we reopen uh, safely uh, in, from a health standpoint. Obviously, that's the first thing. Once the pandemic is controlled, or as Guilherme said, once the data shows us that look, we should go ahead with this. Uh, in order for the the schools for not to be you know uh, locuses of dissemination and more locus of dissemination for people to feel safe. Countries have shown that you need a very, uh, very good protocols in, in terms of sanitary uh, protocols. But that's only part of the, of the challenge. There's a, another thing that we have to prepare uh, 
and, 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 and this relates to the how uh, to come back, which is what, what is going to be the educational response once we reopen? Uh, because if on mo most municipalities, they all of a sudden decided to reopen now, uh, let's say the, you know, the pan pandemic just disappears all of a sudden, and, and now it's safe to, to reopen, and they want to reopen next week, it's going to be a disaster uh, in, in terms of, uh, of the education response that uh, they will be able to provide because most places are, even, are not even preparing themselves to this education response. And it's an educational response that, to go back to something we, we mentioned in, in the beginning, uh, where edu education, the educational sector, the school, uh, you know, the secretaries of education on their own, they're probably not going to be able to face this challenge uh, on their own. Because again, we're talking about multiple dimensions of, of impact, health, health uh, social, a school dropout. You're going to need help uh, and support from the health department uh, in terms of public policy. You're going to ha need help from the social assistance department uh, in the municipalities, or else again the response is not going to be adequate. So we got to make it a safe return when it's possible, but we got to make it a quality return when it's possible to return. And here to give a, 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 a get a little bit into the third and last uh, phase, but uh, this quality response has got to be long-term response. Uh, Fernando Abruzzo, who's a very pro prominent uh, researcher here in Brazil, released an article last week, and I think he, he hit it on the, on the mark, where he said, look, uh, we, gotta think, uh, we gotta think about a two-year plan at least, and how do we do in the next two years, how do we, we get three years in two years, and how do we prepare for that? Uh, because by and large, we, you know, I, I don't like the thing that we lost a year, I think there's brilliant effort from many schools, many teachers. So it's not general that it's been a lost year, but by and large, uh, the data shows that we haven't been able to do much the, this, this year. Uh, so it's gonna be three years in two years. And how do we prepare for that? What do we do? How does the school calendar look like? What does the curriculum look like? What about school? How many school hours the kids are gonna spend in school? And something that you, you probably see, saw here in Brazil, and it's still the case by and large, which when we say to folks outside of Brazil and more developed countries, we talk about full day schools here in Brazil. So oh, we, got, we have to increase the number of full day schools. And oftentimes folks from, uh, from these countries are like, what does that mean, full day schools? Because uh, here we just call it school. Uh, you know, schools that have seven hour, uh, six, seven hour a day, just called school, not full day school. But here in Brazil, most, most schools are still in four or five hour shifts. Uh, and, and not the full day thing. That's a discussion we have to be, to be having. But again, it requires investment. If you're going to increase the amount of hours the kids are going to be there, it goes back to top of this point. And, and, and Lishan said this. Now, when we need to have a, a response that requires more investment, we have the challenge of uh, the fiscal crisis that we're, uh, that we're seeing at the moment. So, but there are ways to, do, to go about this. I think that's the, that's the message that has to, to become stronger, that... But it requires work, it requires planning, it requires long-term vision. And uh, unfortunately, by and large, we're not yet seeing this. But uh, folks like Tabata, who, who are at the forefront of the debate, of the public debate and National Congress, uh, you know, luckily we have uh, you know, folks that are trying to change this wave and, and bring the debate uh, to a more serious and, uh, and more responsible uh, approach. Thank, thank you. So now, I, 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 before, Kind of closing on the question of, of what are the most important both short and long term steps to take, I want to ask Raphael to come in with a few of the questions that have been we've been collecting in the chat. Raphael? Sure, thank you, Anne, and thank you, all the panelists. Uh, incredible discussion. Uh, there's a lot of amazing questions in the chat. I hope we can get through them. The first one that I want to read is from Michael Pippinger. Uh, he wants to, first of all, you know, thank you to all three speakers for the excellent and incisive analysis. We are grateful for your expertise, time, and commitment to this fight. His question is, what role do you see, if any, for institutions outside of Brazil, like the United Nations, the University of Notre Dame, Catholic Relief Services, to be aligned in solidarity and help mitigate the consequences of the pandemic on young people? I could say something being outside Brazil. <laughs> if you'd like. So, sure. you know, in the university here, I guess, as a researcher, you know, one of the um, most prominent roles is to try to generate rigorous evidence that will inform policy making. That's not enough. I think in the chat, there's someone also asking like, uh, you know, more data, there's already a lot of data, but uh, you know, it's, 
you need sometimes the right data to influence the debate and you know allow people like Olavo and Tabata to uh, steer the, the, the debate in the right direction. So I think what the uh, foreign institutions can help with is really try to provide either the funding or the technical capabilities such that we generate evidence where we need it the most. It's not any type of evidence. For instance, we need to know what are the right protocols such that schools reopen. That requires, you know, being able to evaluate this requires strong partnership with at least one education secretariat, requires the technical expertise, the funding to run this. And I know the ecosystem is aligning, you know, and creating the connections for this to happen. But this all, in a sense, can only happen with outside funding, with the outside combination of outside and, and, and internal expertise. Another example of this is a study ongoing that we're doing with CONASEMIS, which is the National Association of uh, Health Municipal Secretariats, to try to understand whether federal support for them to procure uh, health items in the context of the using health transfers that try to support them fighting the pandemic, whether that can make a huge difference. Because of a problem that's been already mentioned in this debate many times, municipalities, they have most of the responsibilities in fighting the pandemic in health and education, but they have very limited capacity to do that. The municipal staff is often underqualified and, you know, the challenge is very, is very high. So in, in that study, for instance, we're evaluating what happens if the national uh, advocacy office provides legal templates for all the procurement documents that the secretaries have to use to buy uh, health safe uh, personal equipment or even like to hire emergency professionals and so on uh, trying exactly to play this role where the federal government or the higher levels they actually support municipalities in doing their job but to generate evidence on that, it's hard. You have to run experiments. You need, again, funding. You need convening power to make it happen. And the international organizations in that sense, be them universities, uh, think tanks, or the United Nations and so on, can play a big role. But you have to be entrepreneurial in a sense. No one is going to call you to come and, and do research. <laughs> so I've been doing a lot of uh, local engagement to try to do that. Thank you. Uh, or, or anything to add? add? Let me just let me just add. I that agree, hundred percent. <laughs> Same. So we're good on this question. I just I wanted to just add that Michael Pippinger, who filled this question, is the um, so, um, vice president and associate provost for internationalization here at Notre Dame, and he directs uh, Notre Dame International. So we're we're grateful for his participation in the session. And maybe really quickly here, sorry to, I, I said, okay. I, I agree with Guilherme, but just to reinforce something that I mentioned in the, in the, in the last round, uh, there's going to be a need for tremendous support uh, outside of education or the school base. So social assistance, for, for example, it's going to be huge. And, 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 and no, I know I'm not an expert on this, but uh, again, uh, Catholic Relief Services and Notre Dame is very much involved in uh, all over the world. And uh, efforts uh, focused on uh, uh, social assistance of poorer regions. Uh, uh, I, I think that sort of work uh, in the current, current scenario becomes even, even more important, especially in the, in the poorer regions. Uh, again, inequality, we all knew that it was huge in Brazil. The, 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 tr the truth of the matter and the sad part about this is that this pandemic will only increase it. Uh, and uh, the efforts, again, that are focused on, on on the poor regions and getting extra investment there and more than investment, as Lishan said, uh, technical capacity. The, the real trouble is capacity. Uh, in municipalities in Brazil, that, that's, that's the trouble. Uh, you need investment, but you need capacity to, to be able to make good use of these resources, uh, especially in unprecedented times. Folks are we're not even close, prepared to, to what we need to, to, to do. So, uh, I just reinforce again on the social assistance uh, segment. I think there's a lot of work to be done there, not just on the next few months. Again, I think it's a long term effort here over the next few years. Okay, are there a couple of other questions that you'd like? Maybe just read, read a couple of them and then we can see if there are responses. Sure, yeah. So, um, as uh, Guilherme uh, alluded to, there's another question that deals with data. And essentially, the question is, how do we create evidence, but at the same time ensure that it actually serves as the basis for our next steps in education, especially in a moment where all kinds of data in Brazil is being questioned, no matter where it's coming from. 
And do you want me do you want me to keep reading a few other questions and the panelists can decide which Why don't you which read one like answer? two more questions and then we can give, sure. give it to you. Yeah, so um, Marcio Bahia um, also asked a question that uh, specifically deals with the public management of the pandemic. So uh, he says that since the management of the pandemic was assigned to governors and municipalities who are the ones who are having the best responses to the pandemic, such as preparation for coming back, trying to provide students with basic technology, what are some good examples and who are some good examples of, of, of good uh, actions for this and, and which ones may not be such great examples and what can we learn from both of them? Anything, have you, uh, is, is there a third you want to put up there or should we just give it back to them? And I guess the third one actually also is that I think this one's more of a general question. What can we as ordinary citizens do to alleviate or improve any other problems highlighted below today? Okay, and so we'll, 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 we'll close with that third question, but, ha but if you'd like to address the question, uh, the question uh, of uh, on uh, any of the, 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 the these previous questions uh, on data or Marcio's on um, uh, future leaders, um, or feel free to jump in. Tabata, is it? Tabata, you're up. Okay. So uh, I very much like the first question. This is one of the reasons why I decided to run. I don't know if that's the answer you were uh, expecting, but wow, we need more people in politics who are committed to evidence-based public policies, who are committed to have a, like, how can I say, a big dialogue with everyone, who are more interested in solving the problems we have than in being popular in social media. And I definitely need some companions. So if any of you is interested in running for politics, I have been working in a few uh, organizations and initiatives such as Acredito, Vamos Juntas, especially to get more women involved in politics. And of course, we can do an amazing work as a civil society in terms of putting forward a discussion, bringing different actors to talk about it. But at the end of the day, we need more people um, who just have a different approach to politics to be elected. And for those who are Brazilians, we have elections in less than two months. I'm not a candidate myself, thank God, but I am supporting uh, 150 candidates from all over the country because I truly believe that the, this is the best investment I can make of my town. Uh, help other people to come. So hopefully in the future, we won't be so lonely in, in this type of debate. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the question that Professor Marcio brought, um, well, I think Paraná has been doing a very good chore, uh, very good uh, work in terms of dealing with the pandemics. It's really, like, it's really nice to, to look at what they are doing. Sao Paulo is also doing a, a good cho job in terms of, uh, well, there are many challenges here, but also this is the biggest state. But in terms of uh, giving access to education, uh, to internet, to all students, the, uh, the Amazon state also uh, has had a good experience in the past that was before the pandemic in terms of, of using uh, TV to providing access to a quality education to those communities who live uh, weeks and weeks uh, far by, by boat. But uh, unfortunately, I think uh, the, the go back to school that was conducted in Amazon, it uh, failed in terms of having a good planning. So that's why it's important for us to remember that if we go back to school tomorrow with our planning, or with all, all those protocols, well, then we can, we can fail and have a similar experience to, to what they faced in the first uh, weeks in, in the Amazon region. And it's important to say that uh, the biggest uh, problems they had were, was with uh, teachers who are older. So that's why we have been talking so much about uh, we need those protocols. We, we, need, uh, we need to know what's the distance, uh, wh what, is the, what we need to do, and what uh, citizens can do. I think having this conversation is something so important. Um, again, our country is going through such a fragilized but like fragmented moment and divided moment. And it has been really hard to have any type of conversation when people tend to think that, as we say in Portuguese, everything is either eight or 80. 
and, and there is no middle ground there people are not interested in building bridges and trying to find solutions so talk to your friends about this and try to show both sides and again we have elections in less than two months and i i really have no idea where it will fall in the political spectrum but i'm only asking you to get more engaged if you if you only wait to see who are the candidates who are going to appear on television or give you their pamphlet well probably those are the best funded uh, politicians who have been there for decades if not <laughs> for more than that so maybe do some research and i'm sure you'll be able to find some who represents you but is underfunded has more visibility and try to get engaged in some campaigns we literally have a chance every two years of rewriting our our future and pointing our boat to a different direction and we definitely need to point our Brazilian vote to a different uh, direction. So get more involved as a citizen and maybe think about running uh, in an election in the future. I know this might sound as not such a good idea to some of you, but well, we need people who had great opportunities as the ones that Notre Dame um, provides to come back to Brazil and to enter the public sector. And again, thank you very much. It has been a real honor to, to have this conversation. Guillermo Arulavo, the question of evidence and data on the governors, on leadership, and um, we'll move yeah. into what we can do. On the leadership, I would just add that, you know, trying to find like the good and the bad is a bit of a trap, I would say. I think most education secretariats are doing a real effort you know, an outstanding effort during very difficult times. We've seen the bad results come out uh, recently, for instance, and we've seen that not just now, but during the last, I don't know, two years, we've seen progress. I mean, it's too far from what we need it to be, but, you know, from the small cities in the hinterlands uh, to like states that for a long time hadn't seen any progress in educational indicators, we've seen improvements, especially now for the high school uh, indicators that we haven't, hadn't seen improvements uh, over a very long period. So I think it's not so much of an issue of uh, you know, who is putting effort in and who is not, but it's, uh, you know, even those putting a lot of effort is not gonna be enough because they, there's so many constraints. So everything we mentioned before, connectivity issues, uh, diagnostic, uh, a long-term plan, this is going to be lacking even for the top uh, public managers. How can we support them? How can we shift the public debate towards that? That's the, that should be on the discussion. Thank you. Olavo? Yeah, I think, uh, I think Guilherme, uh, it's the mark well. I think the effort is, uh, is, is huge. Uh, and, uh, it's, and you're probably not going to find, uh, you're not going to find uh, Clear, perfect uh, response because that's just impossible to, to have it at this moment. What I would just underline is that you have a few states and a few municipalities that have done something that seems to uh, to help uh, fa face the, the the complexity and the challenges of, uh, of of the debate of the local debate, which is to uh, institute what uh, and they call it different names, but something like a multi-actor, multi-player roundtable involving you know all of the, the different stakeholders involved in the, you know, really reopening of schools and how do you do the remote learning stuff. So you're talking about obviously the secretary of education, but other uh, secretaries uh, of, of, of the local government, the health department, the, the social assistance, finance department, uh, the teachers, uh, representatives from the parents. Some places have been bringing in students or the, the, the older students for, for, for the discussions, uh, representatives from the unions. What it, it it's a lot more work to try to bring all of the players uh, and the stakeholders to discuss, but it goes back to Tabata's point. Uh, and it's, it's the best solution uh, to have a consistent way, to have a communicated way, to have uh, you know, uh, solutions that in the end uh, will, be, uh, will be followed, will, will, will be uh, uh, you know, championed by the folks who need to implement it. So, uh, Goiás has done that, Marcio, uh, Rondonia has done that, uh, Mato Grosso do Sul has done that, and on a municipal level, Londrina has done that, uh, and Paraná. So if you are more interested in learning more about this, I can send you some materials afterwards. But uh, again, there's folks who are, who, who are taking this serious, and they're trying to maneuver as best they can, involving all the folks that need to be involved in, uh, in this discussion. 
Okay, so for to just to close this out, well, one final minute from each of you. If if one of the challenges that I think if we pointed out is that there are the long term issues of education, of access, of quality that you've all been working for, and working on this question for a long time. And then there are the immediate short term challenges of how do we deal with the with the the urgency of the pandemic. If you could share with us in just like a, a minute, the you know one kind of concrete short term step. And then one concrete long-term term step that we should really be keeping on the horizon as we're moving forward, we'll, we'll kind of put those into the pot for us to think about. You know, one one most urgent short-term step and one long-term step that we need to be thinking about. Tabitha. Well, short term, we need to connect all the students and all the schools. We have plans for that. We have said where the funding can come from, but we need this to be important to people. We need this to be important politically so we can have any chance of uh, putting this in the political agenda. So please get involved in this discussion. I can send the projects to whoever is interested. I've been having many meetings with the government, many meetings with uh, the presidents of the houses and any support is uh, well, well received. And in the long term, well, there are some things uh, maybe not to think about something more technical but we are going to so i try to explain very briefly but we just approved fundeb which is extremely important for education it's the funding of basic education we have an important discussion going on now on how we regulate it so it's in the constitution we have the directrices can someone help me Guidelines. guidelines. Yes, we have put all the guidelines in the constitution. We have been working that for almost two years. And now you have to detail uh, those guidelines, what we need, what we hope for education. We need uh, to, step, to write the national system of education, which is going to be very important for us to have a better uh, chance of facing challenges such as this one. And we have many other important discussions, uh, making sure that we have our students enrolled in what we call full-time uh, schools here in Brazil. And I agree with Olavo, they should just be schools. We have to think about an education that brings uh, a more interdisciplinary approach, that brings arts, sports, culture, for us to learn to be creative, to be resilient, and to be, well, to be citizens in this uh, ever-changing world but some are, those are the things that I keep thinking about. I hope I, I was not too long, I didn't take too long. And again, thank you very much for inviting me. It has been a great discussion. Yeah, I'm not surprised that Tabitha could not limit herself to just one in each category, but that's, that, 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 that's wonderful. Um, Guillerme. I would say that I would focus on connect, what connects the short run with the long run, let's say, which is this word leapfrogging. So we're going to focus on the opportunities that, you know, fixing kind of short-term problems are going to give us such that we can skip many steps that, you know, in normal times, it would take us many years to progress. For instance, we ideally would give every school teacher a connected device such that they can, you know, do a proper job at teaching. And ideally, every student should have free connectivity to study online. That's going to be critical for the short term. But if we're able to pull that off for the long term, that's going to allow us to skip so many steps. So I would try to focus on these opportunities of leapfrogging because we still have, you know, as we mentioned before the pandemic, a huge challenge in terms of bringing education to the 21st century. And, you know, some of the short term challenges might uh, allow us to, to get there faster if we pay attention to the opportunities. Thank you. Olavo. So I'll focus as, uh, as Guilherme did on, uh, on, a, on a possible legacy uh, of, this, of this crisis, uh, call it opportunity. Uh, and, 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 it, and it relates, I think, to, to, to a question that was posed before about you know, what, what can we do here, uh, as uh, folks who are interested in this, in this debate. Uh, I think one of the possible legacies of, uh, of the pandemic, and if folks who are here and have kids who are in school, or school age, and they're not in school now, but they're school age, uh, have been uh, have been seeing how hard it is to do education, uh, how complex it is to uh, to be a teacher, uh, and it, you, you start to see surveys that are picking up on this. You know, uh, all over the world, you know, p parents are finally getting a real sense of how uh, how complex uh, this thing is, and and I think if we are able to sustain and and grow that perception over time. Uh, 
that will it's it's not so tangible but in terms of public opinion in terms of driving priority you know politically uh, that could play a huge role in, uh, in, in, in making sure that the reforms we need to reform, we need to advance in the long term, are sustained politi politically. Because if we take on the premise that school is something easy to do, that you don't, you don't need uh, the teachers that are well prepared and that have a good career and good conditions, if we don't change that mindset that's still very much uh, present in Brazil society, and not just in the, uh, the non-elite, I think big part of the elite uh, of the country, still believes, and maybe that's changing now, uh, that, that school is something that uh, you just go to school and you have somebody there, the famous, uh, we call him Brazil, and, and you probably saw the, the Chia, which is a teacher, which has been somehow the ant. But teachers have to be professionals. They have to be called professionals and they have to be prepared as professionals. And that takes a lot of investment. That takes a lot of seriousness in terms of public policy. Maybe that legacy, if we're able to, to pick on that, uh, in the long run, that might have a positive impact uh, on Brazil. So I'd, I'd, I'd vote for that one in terms of uh, my last comments. Okay, wonderful. Thank you all for the, to, to, thank you to our panelists for the insightful and the incisive commentary to Tabata, Guillerme, and Olavo. Uh, thanks to Thais and, uh, for your organizing work and to Rafael, uh, Father Bob for hosting and um, to Michael Pippinger who, for uh, uh, you know, making all this work at NDI possible. Um, let's just all give a round of applause, uh, you know, virtual applause or, you know, to our panelists. I'd like to thank you, Anne. I'd like to thank you, Tabata, Olav and Guilherme. It was a great debate and I see new, you know, hope for our future. Thank you so much for all you have been doing and for, you know, the great inspiration. Thank you so much. And thank you, the, the audience, for being here. And let's keep, you know, debating <laughs> important, important, you know, issues for Brazil and for the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Anne. That was great. It was great. Thank you so much. It was a good discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. That went really well. Good bye. job, girls. Well done. Thank you, please. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Bye -bye.